Hello, Working Preachers. This is Caroline Lewis, and I'm excited to announce that we are kicking off our fall fundraising campaign this week, starting on Wednesday, November 1st. This November, we're celebrating Working Preacher as a community of thanksgiving, encouragement, interpretation, and imagination by encouraging you to make a gift in honor or memory of a preacher or faith leader who makes a difference in your life. I'll be making my gift in honor of my cloud of witnesses who have encouraged me in my preaching over the years. I've been thinking about my parents, my professors, and my peers. Without their support, I am not sure where I would be today. Will you join me in making a gift before November 30th to celebrate the encouragement you've received from someone on your faith journey? With your support, Countless congregations will be able to hear informed, creative, and transformative sermons. You can make your gift online today at workingpreacher.org. Thank you for your support and making this ministry possible. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. Today's podcast is for... All Saints Sunday, which falls on November 5th, 2023. For those of you who would um, be following uh, the 23rd Sunday after Pentecost lectionary readings, there will be a separate podcast for you to tune into. But uh, our text, as always, for All Saints Sunday, uh, the first reading is Revelations chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. Our psalm is 34, 1 through 10. Uh, and verse 22. Our second reading is 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, and our gospel reading is Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. The Beatitudes. So we're back with the Beatitudes, and which on the one hand is, I, I, I'm glad that we're going to hear these one more time before we do the last part. <laughs> the last part of Matthew, uh, uh, when we end our year of Matthew coming up here in the next three weeks. So it's uh, so it's kind of nice to get back to the Beatitudes and be reminded of what Matthew's up to. But what I find so interesting too with the, with the Beatitudes, with any text, but particularly with a text like this that is so well known, is how different it sounds in different parts of the year. So here we have it on All Saints Sunday, and how different did it sound when we first heard it way, way, way back when in a different part of the year? And so that's always something, right, that the that the preacher is considering is, is what kind of effect does this passage have on this particular Sunday compared to another Sunday where maybe the emphasis is more uh, more on the that call to discipleship that that Jesus is laying out with these with these first words in the Sermon on the Mount but what does it I think for me hearing this passage and thinking about this passage and experiencing this passage and the effect of it on this All Saints Sunday, is the repetition nine times of blessed and blessed and just that rhetorical effect of 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 being blessed or of of feeling and experiencing god's favor uh of course in cer- certain circumstances but that's the that's the first thing that and and a particularly uh blessed and favored and known and regarded and seen on a Sunday when when we are experiencing loss or grief or um, missing our missing loved ones. So that's just my first first reactions to the uh, beatitudes on this Sunday. Caroline, I appreciate that. Um, I don't know if I said this when we uh, did. Um, uh, Matthew 5 before, but um, reading it as we are um, uh, looking at all saints reminded me that when my godfather died, um, I used uh, this text uh, as uh, to say my words about him. Um, but I replaced the word blessed 
with his um, um, the the line he always said when um, you asked him how he was, and that was super never better. And um, that repetition that you were talking about, um, it was a very interesting experience for me as I was reading this text, as you were saying, thinking about All Saints Day, and then remembering how differently it read as I was remembering my godfather, but saying his word, how are you? Super, never better. Mm -hmm. And as in the midst of my morning, I was comforting, comforted. In the midst of my thirst, I was filled. And we go through each of that. In the presence of God, even in the loss of those who have been, uh, who have journeyed with us, um, we can still say we are blessed, super, never better. Mm. The repetition uh, reminds me of a sense of abundance. Mm -hmm. There's enough blessing here to go around. It also characterizes Jesus as somebody who has an intention to bless. This is who he is, which I think, like you said, Caroline, really sets us up for the next three Sundays in Matthew 25, where we're going to need this, remind, this reminder yeah, about Jesus. Blessings. <laughs> yeah. There's also, you know, in terms of the rhythm or the poetry of this passage, there's the fact that the second half of the sentences of almost all of them is, is future. Yeah. Something will happen. So there's this idea of the promises are about the future. The promises are about something next, which doesn't make it or shouldn't make it pie in the sky, but it's a reminder of this theme of reward that's so prominent in Matthew's gospel. Um, so there's some comfort in that on a day that you're remembering people who have passed away. There's also, I think, a way in which it might spur the church or motivate the church as well to think about what it means to be conduits of this blessing as well even today yeah I, I i noticed that this time too matt about the it's fun it's so interesting right that what what strikes you each time we come around the last time this was the fourth sunday of epiphany i believe and then but that that holding of the present and the future blessed are for they will and and how much of that holding of present and future is also about today, about a day like this, about all saints of, of feeling, like you said, Matt, that, uh, that sense of being, um, and that abundant blessing that we have here and now, but then it's also our promise, uh, in the future and that promise for our loved ones as well. And that, like you said, how are we a, a conduit for this? So these blessings, these, they're blessings here and now, but they're blessings that push push forward and they push us forward. And so they're not static, right? They're not, they're, uh, so there's something, there's something really powerful in, in holding those tenses together too, I think, in this passage that, that could have some homiletical traction. The abundance um, in the midst of suffering um, causes me to think of hope. And we are a people of hope. And uh, each of the texts, as they look forward this week, um, are in the midst of um, the reality of suffering. And while the immediacy of remembering those who are lost is before us, um, uh, who have died, uh, are before us, there's also the immediacy of broken promises, um, a society that is not um, a system that is uh, offers success for everyone. And um, when it's really hard to find good news, it's really nice to be reminded that even though we don't see it yet, we have this hope that it will yet come. And the one who offers us this hope, the community that we're a part of where we rehearse this hope um, is a, a community of abundance. Um, and so uh, I, 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 I like that idea that we gather together on All Saints Day, remembering what we've lost with hope that we can face another day. Because sometimes that reminder just puts us right back when we go, I don't think I can go on anymore. And then we hear these words that say, yes, you can, because there's more to come. And that makes it possible 
for me to take another step in the present. Mm. I think another one more thing that I would have is I, I really appreciated the line in the commentary where uh, the the author writes Jesus revalues what has been uh, what has been devalued, and I um, I that is another sort of dynamic here too of that revaluing what's been disvalued that I also thought was really um, a, a helpful way to describe what's happening here in the Beatitudes uh, and to be, yeah, to be valued when you haven't been. And what does that feel like? It's another, I think another important homiletical, homiletical theme in this passage. Yeah, that brings up like how this passage functions on All Saints Day. So the the people he's addressing <clears throat> are people who might not have good reason to hope or might feel that hope has passed them by. I mean, he's talking about people who tend to be those who suffer more than others or at least um, it might more easily be stepped on than others. So the, 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 the temptation perhaps... <clears throat> excuse me, when, when a congregation's remembering those who have passed away in the previous year is to be, you know, we all remember Bill, right? Bill was so poor in spirit. Bill was so meek. You know, Bill was such a peacemaker. I, I wouldn't want to do that in the way where we try to make everybody fit the passage, but I would want the passage to remind us that we also mourn the people whose names we don't know. Yes. Mm -hmm. Who are the people whose names are, uh, are foreign to this congregation who might have passed away and nobody even noticed they were gone? Um, so how does a passage like this help us understand the community of saints as more than just the names who are going to be read, uh, who we all know and remember? Yeah. Yeah. That's really important. Mm -hmm. If we use that as a segue to revelation, yeah. um, two things come to mind. I appreciate Matt, you, um, putting that text back in its historical context and um, uh, revelations for us so often, um, we take all of its imagery um, and we, we fail to attend to those who were hearing that text when it was uh, first written, first read. And um, it fits perfectly for all saints in the same reality of this great multitude of, of, of those we do not know. That was the the segue that your your words make me think of in this. Um, those we do not know. Um, but I want to point to the reality of today. Um, we're um, a few weeks out from the uh, attack uh, uh, in the Middle East that was un unprecedented and yet something we are so familiar with. Um, there is always war in the Middle East. Um, uh, in ancient history, we read about it, um, and we're used to uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians' war uh, throughout our own uh, lifetime. Um, but um, those stories today were stories of names we do not know. On both sides of the conflict, a multitude of people who in essence, are simply looking for that reality that we talked about uh, when we were looking at uh, the gospel reading. Uh, they're in the midst of suffering. Um, they're hungering. They're thirsting. Um, so, Matt, when you make that switch, I think the Revelation text does that for us if we recognize that these are people, a community of people in the midst of an empire whose system is against them. And they are being told the most incredible statement of hope, a gathering together in the name of the Lamb, uh, the name um, uh, of Jesus. And we are a people in suffering. Um, the Palestinians include Palestinian Christians. Um, the Israelis include those who are uh, practicing Jews and people of faith whose government, whose empire is causing them to suffer. And we have this ancient promise that we hold to as a community of Jesus. And maybe those words need to be not simply words for us, 
but words that enable us to live as a people of hope in the midst of a society of dominion. Yeah, you bring up that, you know, the, or what you say brings up for me the, the reality that the people envisioned in Revelation 7 are martyrs. These aren't quote unquote, ordinary dead, <laughs> I can use that expression. Mm -hmm. So these are people who are crying out out of some suffering that they've, that has been um, inflicted upon them. And I love where Anna Bowden takes this in terms of talking about the, the idea of the slaughtered lamb being this reminder of, of kind of the, the meekness or the innocence of Jesus and of the martyrs, but also of, of a slaughter quite, quite literally. And so you know, a passage like this and talking about, you know, Rome's hands are covered in the blood of God's faithful. John paints Rome as bloodthirsty and sadistic, and that just will increase as the book goes on. But for a, again, for a day like All Saints Day, this is a passage that might lead us to reflection on ways in which we are complicit as well in the untimely death of of people who are um, seen as kind of the collateral collateral damage of an empire or of an economy uh, or of a way of life. And so just to, not to pour cold water all over All Saints Day, but just to note that uh, as much as you want to identify with the people in front of the altar, we look a lot like the, uh, the ones who inflict the, the slaughter as well in our own ways. So just to help people imagine that that would require some care from a preacher but our audience is up to that yeah well and that's where the the commentary was really helpful with that and i and and i and such an important um way to yeah think about the you know the the audience of this particular passage and and its role and uh and then also the way in which too that we hear then that last line of the passage and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes and in a, in a, a really kind of profound communal, um, communal global way <laughs> that, uh, yeah, we, we, we cry for our own dead, our own, our own personal ones who've passed away, but the, the way in which God is promising to because God is salvation belongs to our God and blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might to be our God forever and ever uh, that that it's because we have that God that our tears are are wiped away and all all the the tears of all of the death that we experience and so I I think that's an important important aspect of this day that. Uh, that yeah, you're right, Matt. Our our preachers are up to it. They can do that. <laughs> so, yeah. And, that, and, and that's just, oh, go ahead, Joy. No, go ahead. No, I was going to go to the psalm, but I was going to say our context uh, is in need of that um, locally and 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 uh, globally, and uh, to be able to hold to that um, means that we live as a people for whom this only matters if Jesus is, if, if Jesus exists, if Jesus is a promise keeper, if God is faithful. And so it, it has to be more than words. Um, it has to be the way that we walk. And uh, that for me, Caroline, was going to be the segue into to, oh. to the psalm because it says, I will boast, um, playing back on that future tense. Uh, that uh, Matt reminded us of as we were reading the second portion of each of the Beatitudes. Um, in the midst of this day of grief, in the midst of this reminder of loss, in the midst of this society societal moment of suffering, um, whether it's ours or the multitude around us, we can still boast that our life matters because Jesus lives. And so I will make my boast in the Lord. What I what I find really interesting too about the passage about the revelation revelation passage and then also the psalm is the way in which now the blessing we're in, we're we're in charge of the blessing ah. <laughs> that 
you know, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. And then the opening of Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. So there, it, it takes us back to Matthew in terms of that, that mutuality or how is it that, you know, what is our walk or uh, what is it that we are, um, what, how how is it that we're going to continue this work as you put it matt and and how is it that we do our own blessing and what does that look like and that there's a uh, there's a mutuality in that uh, because of our relationship with god and because of of what jesus has done for us which i find really uh, i find really interesting and um and something that I maybe would think about a little bit for this Sunday too uh, is, or how do we carry on the blessing of of how we've been blessed? My mother, uh, my mother on her stone has blessed to be a blessing, which is you know of course from the story of Abraham, but that's what it reminds me of, and that's how she lived. And so she, you can't keep these, you can't keep the blessing to yourself. You have to. You have to let it go and let it go into the world, and um, and then then everybody is able to taste and see that the Lord is good. So, yeah. I don't know if our listeners are hearing this, but um, um, M- Caroline, what you just said in terms of our active um, participation in be- being the blessing. Um, is actually parallel with what you were saying, Matt, uh, in holding us accountable um, as uh, we looked at the Revelation text in terms of how why, how we might be um, not um, so much the martyr, but those who are causing the systems where people are martyred. Um, and that just raises for me a theme that, that I could see preaching from um, weaving those texts together um, in this sense of how we take responsibility for um, our complicit, com- my tongue is not going to spell that word today, but our participation in both sides of, uh, of, of the responsibility here to be a blessing, but the confession to say, maybe I've fallen short and to weave that together. And so that we can acknowledge um all of those that are sitting before us and listening to our voice um, who may find themselves more in one side than on the other. Um, these texts, as uh, I'm listening to the two of you uh, this week, are inviting us to speak to that whole congregation in one sermon where no one is left out and everyone, I think, can uh, hear a word of hope. Should we go to First John? Yeah. So I, I love this because it, uh, it, it there's a nice resonance with um, with with First Corinthians First Corinthians fifteen for me, not that one's dependent upon the other uh, historically or literarily, but this idea of coming to see things more truly, right? That uh, what we will be has not yet been revealed. What a what a lovely humble statement from a biblical author <laughs> not trying to pretend they can explain exactly how we fit into this larger uh existence um beyond this life and what what god's love look like but then it says what we do know is this <laughs> uh when he's revealed um we will be like him for we will see him as he is I think the reference there is God as a, as opposed uh, to Christ. We'll see God as God truly is, which of course is a, an important biblical theme, right? Moses says, show me your glory. God says, I'd love to do that. Can't do that. You can't handle this. Yeah. Uh, but this idea of transformation and the idea of seeing God clearly, which I think means we also see ourselves uh, in an unfiltered way and, other images, a uh, book of Revelation and the white stone, right? With a word on it that nobody knows. I mean, the idea of being known um, fully and completely by God is simultaneously terrifying <laughs> and and uh, and comforting and, and hope-giving. Terrifying only in the sense of like, like what greater kind of intimacy or, or sense of being known could you imagine than something like that? Can I pull a Caroline and drop in John? 
Oh, yes. <laughs> he would be so happy. <laughs> uh, drop in, John, because um, this verse parallels with John 17, 3. Mm -hmm. That this is life eternal. Jesus is praying in the disciples' eavesdrop to know God. And so to know God fully is life eternal. And as you as you referenced, uh, Matt, that uh, when we know God, we know the one whose image we are created to reflect. And so we know we more fully know ourselves. And there there is a terror, but also we have this hope that one day we will be fully known. And I think too, uh, one thing that I would say about this passage and and uh, about the Sunday and thinking about the way in which it might connect with some of the themes that we've already expressed is see what, you know, that opening verse, right? See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And the way in which that is a, is really a renaming of what it means to be blessed, uh, children of God, of that uh, that present and future promise. And then I just I just love the rhetoric of this, and that is what we are. <laughs> you know, just to be utterly clear, <laughs> that is what we are. And because we are children of God, we are the recipients of God's abundant blessings and. And that's at which comes from God's love. So, those would maybe be some of the connections that that I would I would make on this All Saints Sunday. That people know that is who you are. You are a beloved, blessed child of God. <laughs>